Wow, that was loud. All right, greetings, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through my thoughts on how we can use what's taught in the Vienna Anonymous text uh, or book uh, to inform your practice. Um, to start, like I said, I will pause for questions at the end of each section. So please hold your questions until then. Write them down if you need to. Uh, and then at the end, I will have, I'll open up for more questions. Uh, I need to cut off at three o'clock. So I'm going to try and, and get through this as efficiently as I can, but I do want to have a good discussion. I found this, this manual, this book, whatever we want to call it, be extremely informative in, in a lot of different ways. And I'll get to that. Um, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, let me start with the SCA version. In the SCA, I am Aaron Harper. Uh, I'm a member of the Anstiorn Order of the White Scarf, the Laurel, and the Order of Defense. I've been playing in the SCA for 26 years. I've been a White Scarf for 22 years. I was made a Laurel for historical combat generally in 2006. Um, I was the premier society deputy ANS minister for historical combat. I wrote the rules that are still in use and kind of got that rolling so that people can practice a variety of different weapons that may not be legal on the field. And I've lived in and won tournaments in four different kingdoms uh, and at Gulf Wars uh, across the known world. I'm also more mundanely a Tattershall instructor since 2005. I've taught hundreds if not thousands of students across more than 20 states and Canadian provinces. I also, I'm planning to reopen a Tattershall school here once we can all get back together and start practicing in person and I'll be exploring in like eight and 12 week uh, classes, uh, structured ways of getting at the Northern Italian sword style, both uh, side sword and rapier style. In HEMA and the Western martial arts, I created Lord Baltimore's Challenge, which is an annual independent sword event with tournaments on one day and then classes from the best instructors in the world on the next. Um, we're gonna have the next one in 2022, more about that hopefully in the coming months. Um, I've taught at some uh, Western martial arts workshops in the past, and I've fought in and won HEMA and Western martial arts tournaments, aside from SCA tournaments. All that to say, I've been working from and trying to apply the historical manuals since about 1997, and I've been refining my interpretation and approach the entire time in a variety of venues, and, and still are, clearly. I'm still trying to learn what I'm doing wrong and what I can do better. So let me start the discussion itself with what is this Vienna Anonymous? For those of you who don't know, and for those in posterity, because I'm gonna put this up on my Tattershall page uh, later, the manual we refer to as the, the Vienna Anonymous is 53 handwritten pages sewn together into a single gathering. And it's housed in the princely collection of the Liechtenstein Museum or palace in Vienna. Um, it looks like through the evidence that whoever created this was wanting to make it into a book. It, it references three different fencing manuals and it seems to reference what was gonna be illustrations as well. Um, so it looks like they had kind of sketched out their thoughts of, of what they know of fencing from these manuals and were gonna publish it, but it doesn't seem like it ever got published. So sometime in the early second decade of the 17th century, uh, a fencer, we don't know whom, took it upon himself or herself to write a detailed explanation of the art of the single rapier by closely referencing and expanding on the written instructions of Salvatore Fabris, Rodolfo Capofero, and po probably a third uh, that we don't know who it is. It was completed in September of 1614, uh, and it fills in some of the details that were glossed over or left out of the manuals, which is one of the reasons it's extremely important. Uh, the several internal references to numbered plates suggest that the plan was to include illustrations, like I just mentioned. Um, also interesting, this book was finished in Igra, which is a modern day Cheb in the Czech Republic, which is a short drive from the German Bavaria. So it was, it was actually written and finished in uh, Bohemia uh, in, in the current modern day Czech Republic. So someone who probably had a lot of Germanic and Italian influence, but wasn't quite in either one but it was, it was written in Italian. So there are references to actions and pages from Fabris, Capafero, and an LS. Uh, and in some cases, almost entire passages are repeated from those manuals. So this is someone who took 
the writings of Fabris and the writings of Capafero and kind of melded them together, which I've been doing myself for a while. So I'm glad to see I'm not completely crazy. Um, but it gets at the point that the Northern Italian system is, is one system and that these books were just kind of their, the author's interpreta interpretations of this one system. In this same vein, really quickly, uh, there are also the C13, whoop, hold on. Got to let Mike in from Ireland. Um, so in the same vein of the Vienna Anonymous, there's also the C13 and MS17533 manuals. These are two largely identical books, one written by Johann Pasha, dated to 1671, and the other one probably by the fencing manual, Heinrich von Onsomsbeld, uh, dated to the middle of the 17th century. And these are very similar. They are kind of uh, uh, class notes on Fabris and uh, expand on it. C13 has 428 lessons that expand on it. And then the other one has like uh, 130 or something lessons and 93 drawings. So I haven't yet gotten to that. I want to get to that next because it's kind of similar. It kind of fills in a lot of the spaces. And Rainier Van Nort, who did the translation, said that it completely impacted the way he fights and he, he thinks through fighting. So to sum up, these are the books written as further explanations or applications of Fabris and Capafero. Um, it's a contemporary fencer, which is the important part, a contemporary fencer's explanatory notes on this system. Someone who was living it, someone who had a sword in hand and was trying to work through it themselves. So this is kind of a look into the Sal and how you might have actually taught these things. Um, while some have kind of dismissed the Vienna Anonymous when it came out as, well, it didn't teach me anything new, that by itself is incredibly important because that means our, our beating this into place over the past 20 years I've been working on it has actually gotten us pretty much to the right place because this person agreed with what our interpretations are for the most part. All right, so let me pause there for any questions. If anyone wants to ask any questions about the manuals and, and what I know about that itself. Good, all right. We have 18 participants. And like I said, I'll keep watching to see if anyone else joins. So onward, now for my own thoughts on what I learned. I have I one learned. question before you move on. Yes, ma'am. Um, when Tom gave that presentation at the last Lord Baltimore's challenge and he was talking about uh, how many people's handwriting were in there. Mm -hmm. I forgot what he said about how many hands that he found and where it seemed like those people were from. Do you remember any of that? Can you distill that in a sentence or two? So he said that there were three different handwritings and the theories I think are either that the author, him or herself wrote part of it and then uh, a scribe sketched some of it out or as Tom also says, um, we all have different handwritings. So it might've been that this person sat down at one time and sketched something out very quickly and then sat down later and wrote more slowly, for instance. So we don't know exactly how many people are involved. And the C13 uh, that Rainier uh, 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 translated also is, is similar. It has multiple handwritings. And so it's possible that a scribe did part of it and then Pasha did part of it and, and so on and so forth. So that's what we know. We don't know anything more than that. All right, uh, hold on. One more admission, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna try and list my thoughts in order of specific things that are explained better. And at the end, I'm gonna to move to, to a couple of broader concepts where you can apply those specific things. Uh, bear in mind, some of these things may not be, or at least feel new to you, but they are new to the academia basically, and they will be new to, to other people. So, um, or as I said, these are reinforcing ideas that we had to stitch together. So therefore it's simply showing that we were correct. So, so bear with us here. If I say something that you're like, yeah, whatever, then, then just, just wait it out and we'll get to something else that I can almost assure you will be a little bit different for you. So let's start with the idea of gaining the sword. There's been a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about what it means to gain the sword. So here I'm gonna try and use the Vienna Anonymous to clarify at least what that author meant and when to do it and why. So he subdivided it, or she subdivided it into three types. The author describes gaining the sword in three different ways. 
simply gaining it, as taught on page 18 of Fabris, it says, gaining it while also shutting the opponent's sword out of presence, which is much safer than a simple gain. And when the opponent's point is in your presence and you beat it out of line with the debole into his more debole to make it go out of line and then you strike before he can recover. So I'll break those down and talk a little bit about each one really quickly. So a simple gain, a simple gain doesn't remove their point from your presence. If I'm gaining a blade in a simple gain, they can still thrust directly right at me. But in order to hit me, they have to go through my forte. So I'm making it very risky for them to try and attempt uh, any attack. Um, so this, this requires me laying more of my blade over their blade. So this is basically the stringer we talked about, the uh, stringere. You move into wide measure, you stringer the opponent while their blade is pointing at, at your body, your vita. And if they extend and you do nothing, then they can still hit you. Um, understanding that a gain is not necessarily a stringer, but a stringer does have a gain in it. I will talk about that more in a podcast I'm doing this week, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Uh, but a beat is a gain, but a beat is not a stringer. So they're, they, they are separate concepts. It's just one might be included in the other one. Um, interestingly enough, Vienna Anonymous doesn't use the word stringere that I've seen at all so far. Uh, he uses the guadagnare, which is to gain or to get something, or acquisto, which is to purchase, uh, to obtain something. So the author talks, talks about gaining, to purchase, to obtain the thing, but he doesn't go into any detail, it seems like, about stringere. So that, I, found, I found that kind of interesting. The only change here from my past training is in understanding that this, there, is, there are three different versions of the gain, that, that, that they, they were subdivided in three different ways by at least this author. So the second version, gaining and shutting out the opponent's sword out of presence, this is much safer. This is when you are wholly defended on the straight line between their point and your body. So your sword is in the way of any straight line that they can get to you. Um, the opponent is unable to bring their point back online into, into your presence and strike you. Um, the only way they can is to push your sword out of the way, but you should have your forte at their devil a, so therefore pushing yours out is difficult. So this forces them to make two tempi, whereas a simple gain, they can still make a simple tempi if, if you do nothing. In this, they cannot do anything without making two tempo to come in and on you. So one way to do this, for instance, is to not approach your opponent in a straight or predictable line. Uh, the description given is when the opponent's point is not aimed at your body, you should constrain the blade and step not on the straight line toward your opponent, but a little bit more off. And in fact, it talks about leaning your head and your body a little bit more away from the blade. So you are constraining the blade and stepping further away from it uh, to make sure that point goes past you. So you're shutting that point out. So one thing to start doing is to start practicing that. And I'll give you some more details later on about how to practice that better. Um, but also practice when your opponent is pointing at you, you can close by stepping slightly to one side or the other, and you're closing their blade out as you're doing that step. Uh, this may necessitate you're going in on your opponent as a, at a zigzag as they try and regain the line and you're gonna step and close out again on the other side. So this is where we're not thinking straight into your opponent, but you're thinking getting on one side of the blade, getting on the other side of the blade, getting on the other side of the blade as you close into your opponent. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have a few quotes, by the way, here that I may read as we go through from the Vienna Anonymous itself. Um, but basically, I've kind of covered it. If his sword is in your presence and you want to shut it out, you must bring your body out of presence of his point. So that's the one, the one thing that is said. Um, if the sword is in your body's presence, in that same tempo that you forced him to parry, you remove your body from the point's presence by placing the foot that is first to enter Medra Larga on the straight line, bring your head and body to that side where you shut out their blade. So I, I kind of described that as well. Um, so let me give you a quick example. Let's say you're approaching and you're starting to stringer on the outside. So I've got them blocked off on my right. On that step that I enter into measure, I'm gonna to continue to step off to my left, to my more inside line, while keeping my blade there and keeping them from bringing it back to the inside. They are now pointing past me and my blade is in the way of them fixing that, okay? 
Um, yeah, and even and the, and the Vienna anonymous author even quotes Fabris by saying, "Gaining and shutting out the opponent's sword is the first part of victory," and says, "For this reason, you need to learn to do it very well, more than with any other technique." So. You need to learn how to use your sword free by cavatione because as your opponent tries to regain, you'll be cavationing or you'll be dodging. And you need to understand mesura larga. So we will get to the, the large measure in just a minute. So number three, the, the beat. This is very quick. When the opponent's point is in your presence and you beat it with the debole of your sword into his more debole. And that by that, I mean, you're still putting more of your blade on his when you're beating it out of the way. And then you can strike before they can recover. I think all of us know this, this action. We, it's one of the first things you learn is to beat the blade out of the way and go straight in. But this is also considered by the Vienna Anonymous author a gain. You are gaining the blade because you're kind of owning it for, for that brief instant. Um, the most useful thing on this to, to note that he talks about or she talks about is you should only do it against less experienced fencers. The author notes that it's dangerous to do this last one against experienced fencers, and it's better to not rely on it in those cases, but you can do it against those who aren't fast on their feet and who haven't figured out that once they're there, once you're starting to move to the blade, they should just drop it and let you fly over their, theirs, right? Um, as a tactical point on the gain, real quick, the author also says there are three reasons to gain the sword. To enter more safely into measure, uh, when you gain and simultaneously shut the sword out of line, you're also staying safe and forcing a tempo. So forcing a tempo is number two and uncovering the opponent's uh, target is number three. So that's just kind of tactically thinking you would use the game for those three reasons. Um, I'll add one last thing and then I'll stop for questions. On page 23 of the manual, on the last paragraph, I just saw last night something that was interesting. The gist is, if you go to shut out one side of their sword and they quickly move to put their point in presence again, you take that tempo to then move to the other side. Let them take that side and you're taking the other side back. So again, this is that zigzag I was talking about. But if the opponent is skillful enough to not let you shut them out, then limit yourself to the simple game. Don't try and get yourself twisted in the knots if they're really good and aren't letting you do it. Uh, so we, we may get to this later on again in our last section, but it's important to understand that this shutting out is not a static situation. You are shutting out for a brief instant because your opponent is probably gonna react to that. So you have to then rearrange and do something else. And that is part of what we'll get to at the very end of this entire discussion. All right, I will pause for questions. Anything anyone got? So David, yes. if I understand this correctly, this is kind of contradicting Capraferro's idea that you should maintain a straight line and there's no reason to step off that line. Here's I don't think like so. I don't think so. I, I go back and forth on whether he's talking about maintaining a straight line with a sword or with your straight actions. So when I've read it recently, maintaining a straight line to me, he also talks about that means the elbow to the sword is one straight line. Uh-huh. Okay. So, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I will read this again with that in mind, but I don't think it does uh, go against Capaferro. I will say that the Vienna Anonymous does seem to take pieces of both Fabris and Capaferro and put them together. For instance, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, the Terza that the Vienna Anonymous talks about is Capaferro's Terza. It's not Fabris's. Uh-huh. So this is, you might say, a conglomerate of, of those books. So it may be that he kind of disagrees with Capaferro at some point. But so I would challenge anyone who wants to look into that to, to try and dig a little bit and see if you agree or disagree uh, with that idea. Cool, because this feels like Giganti 101, like come in at an angle, close yeah. out, at least the way I would interpret it. So that's interesting. But bear in mind also, Capaferro does talk about trying to get away from the blade as he moves in as well. So mm -hmm. there is still, I mean, there's still hints. And this is where I'm saying that filling in the gaps here is just, whoa, you know, opened up eyes to a lot of, a lot of how we are doing this slightly incorrectly. Cool, very cool. All right. Um, and Lisa, I'll get to your question. Well, no, I'll go ahead and get to it now. Does Vienna Anonymous say anything about touching the blade when gaining? Do not touch. Vienna Anonymous is on board with do not touch the blade. 
which is interesting because the author also talks about gliding down the blade. But at one point, if I remember correctly, in the author's description of gliding, they also talk about you're still not touching. So by gliding, you're still you're following the blade, but you're not particularly touching it still until that last moment when you lock it out and you get the, the get the attack. So yeah, the 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 author is on board with the fact that you do not want to touch your opponent's blade. Okie dokie. So next section, how to address the gain or how to address or gain someone in a low terza or refused guard. So I see a lot of people when faced with someone who dropped the point or who withdraws the sword to their hip, they kind of give up on the idea of stringering the opponent's sword and they just kind of float it out in the space in between. So they really are giving up a good portion of what the Northern Italian system is trying to bring to bear. Um, so here we'll, we'll, we'll address that using the Vienna Anonymous's words and also the things that I've, I've been trying to do as well. Um, the author says, you cannot drain a withdrawn sword from Mijera Larga. So they are correct in that they are drawing you in. In order to gain their sword, you do have to step in a little bit more. So the advice here from the Vienna Anonymous is you get in a narrow stance, meaning your feet get narrower. You bend forward as much as you can while still moving comfortably to reach the sword and to gain it. So if someone's got a withdrawn sword or, or well, the withdrawn sword specifically, the point here is you want to get in one of the forward leaning uh, stances, postures, narrow your feet, and then you're going to gain the sword that way. And now we'll, we'll touch on how that works. And this is for both a low sword and a refused sword. Uh, the, the author says, understand that covering, when I say covering, it's the same thing as gaining or shutting out the opponent's sword, but it's done when he is in a low guard. So to gain a low sword, you place yours you place your sword to his debole on his edge with your point aimed at, at the hilt. Always keep your point higher than their hil hilt to force them to lift the point on either side, which will then give you a tempo. If your opponent doesn't move, you attack into it. So what's really happening is you're aligning your sword along theirs and pointing at their hilt. You're creating a straight line over their sword that they have to then decide which side to come up on. And making that decision, you have now defined their game somewhat for them. And as they come up, that is your tempo to drive in by adjusting it some on one way or the other. Um, another quote, if the opponent has it on a straight line, simply gain it, as we just described. If he has it on an oblique line or out of presence, shut it out by keeping yours level with your point as high as your hilt, but never lower. So. The advice here is if your opponent's in a low guard, you don't go into a low guard, you keep yours at a level at them. And you can shut it out then because if they're pointing away from your body, as we just discussed, you try and move away from that from their point. You want to do this in a forward leaning posture, just like I, I mentioned, not a back weighted terza. Uh, the authors further supports this idea when they write, furthermore, if he keeps his sword low and his body withdrawn, you get into a narrow stance to gain the sword and you bend your body forward as much as possible. So one variant that I've been playing with before I even re read this was people who, who they cock that sword back at their hip. If I'm gonna go into a, let's say a, 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 a forward leaning quarto, very forward leaning, I'm gonna lay my blade low, aimed kind of near, I would say their hips, but I'm cutting off any line they have of bringing that sword up quickly. So I have now blocked them from that snap up that they're trying to do. They now have to do a, a, an around my sword if they're going to do anything. And if they don't move, I'm just going to go straight in. I'm not going to take any time to wait because I am protected while they now have to process a whole new situation. So that's something that I've been doing, which is almost right in long, line with what he's talking about. I just angle my blade a little bit to catch that, that rising straight line. So instead of making them go on one side or the other, I'm trying to stop that from happening at all. Um, all right, let me pause there for questions. That's the end of that section. No questions? I don't want no, to. No, we go, when we go, when we go. Okay. Real question, the question I had is what was meant by a narrow stance? So a narrow stance is, whenever they say narrow stance, that tends to mean your feet are narrower together. 
Okay. So think about my terza, my, my very wide stance, Capoeira terza. The narrow stance is bringing those feet closer together and you're a little bit more upright or bent forward is what tends to happen. Thank you. Awesome. Are you, question, are you, yep. are you changing your, your measure for this really? Are you going to, to cover this? How close are you getting? Are you still really being in a Missouri Larga as you start out and come in or are you covering more uh, closer for this purpose? Given well, the author, the author says you cannot cover a withdrawn sword in Misra Larga. You can cover a low terza, someone who drops their point to the ground. So what I would say is a low terza, I could enter Misra Larga and then transition to quarta without, mm -hmm. without changing my feet, and I could cover a low, uh, a low terza. Someone who pulls the sword back to their hip, I imagine I would have to get into a strata before I, I would be covering their blade. I can visually cover it. I can still cover right. them their attack but I wouldn't be gaining the sword really until I was a little closer in. That, that's my interpretation. And uh, just to, when you're dealing with, you mentioned keeping the point at, from, from VA's point of view, the mentions the point at the hilt. Um, is that just when their opponent, the opponent is straight on or, cause I'm, I'm, I'm my visualization is slower than your words. So right, right. Right, um, straight on or um, when the, they're at an oblique? The author mentions pointing at the hilt several times throughout the manual. Yeah, so, and I'm trying to, to see how that's going to work versus in action. Right. So um, think about your opponent is, is in, even, even a regular terzo with a straight sword at you, not with it cocked up, but straight at you. Mm -hmm. You still might lay your blade over them and aim near their hilt. Mm -hmm. and, and control their blade that way. Um, so I think a lot of the ways that the Vienna Anonymous is, is acting is you are trying to subdivide their actions by simply creating the space on top of their blade that they have to come up on. Mm -hmm. and, and that does it. Even if their, their, their sword is pointed away from you, uh, he still talks about you can still point your, your point at their hilt and you still have control of that fight because you still created this line that they can't cross to get back to you. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking. I was thinking more in terms of up down versus side side. Yeah, but yeah, up down. You're you're still stopping that space. Now, okay. my variation of that is, I'm not going to aim at the point as much as I'm going to aim over over kind of the middle of their blade to stop them from impact from from coming up. Right. But that to me is forcing them to either pull back all the way or to go way outside. So yeah. it's kind of a variant of what the Vienna Anonymous is, is saying to do, but I think it falls within the same uh, okay. so that's technical what possibility. I, that's yeah. what I'd be more likely to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, I think, yeah, you and I have worked on that before years ago, yeah. I believe. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on. Missouri Larga and what it's for. So, it's interesting, some of the things I'm going to talk about, a lot of us do, but I don't think we really thought in this way of, 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 of what it means. So wide measure, and wide measure is when I can hit my opponent only if I take an extra step. So I'm, I'm within distance of, of, of hitting them, but I can't do it by just reaching out or bending, all right, just to define what wide, wide measure means. It isn't just the bet place where we're finally close enough to hit or be hit. This is an area where you are setting the tone for the fight and you need to open with the advantages. This is where if, if you don't start commanding the actions, you will be commanded in turn uh, by your opponent. So once you've gotten that step closer into measure a strata, into more narrow measure, if you don't have the dynamics largely under your control, you've lost the advantage and you've probably lost the fight. So this is the key place where you're starting to set up the chess match, if you want to, to, to think about it that way, okay? So one thing to note is you are, you are measuring Mizura Larga by whether your opponent can reach you, not vice versa. And I, I taught this recently in one of my classes, so I know Lissa knows and a few others uh, have, have heard this before. But what we do is we pay attention to our opponent's front foot because that tells you how far away from you they are. Um, I advise all of you to practice and really understand your own measure, your own reach well enough that you don't have to think about it at all in a fight. You want to be able 
to drop into posture in front of an opponent or a target and know whether you can hit your target and generally what it will take to do so, whether you can just reach out and hit it, whether you need to lean or whether you need to take that step, okay? So practice so much that you are very familiar with what your own measure is. Then when you're sparring, you are freed up to start paying attention to where their lead foot is, because that tells you all you need to know about their measure and, and how close they are to you. Um, so again, I, I, I want to impress upon people the importance of solo training. Uh, e even when we're able to be back in person, I can talk at length about it, but I have lots of videos on my Tattershall DC channel where I, I do try to go into, into discussion of the importance of solo training. And this is part of it because thinking about your own actions in a fight uh, can get you killed. You want to free up your own brain to watch what your opponent is doing. Um, also note about Majora Larga. The Vienna Anonymous author points out that invitations are only done in Majora Larga. And this is an interesting point that I think I've done, but I've never thought about it. Um, it certainly points out one of the fallacies of, of setting up too close. If you set up too close, you've already lost a good deal of your tactical tools. Uh, and this is, by the way, this is what I call gunslinging. When you set up so close that the fight becomes more about speed and fast reaction than about a tactical chess game. And some people want to do that, and that's cool. I don't want to sneer down at gunslinging like some people do, because it is a fun game when you do it. But if you're trying to play the tactical chess game and you set up where your blades are already halfway crossed, you've lost almost all of your tools at that point in time. So this is what the, the author is trying to get at. Uh, once you've reached Misra Stretta, you are too close to give invitations. The author also specifies that you use invitations against opponents who clearly want to attack, people who are just revving up to come in and attack you. Um, I wouldn't limit it to those fighters. Certainly when you play with opponents who are itching to come in, give them a big reason to but make sure you do it at wide measure and, and try to play with others as well, because at wide measure is a good time to try out all of your opponents and see what they're up to doing. Um, so the author says, to enter into Misera Larga, therefore, combatants will exercise every possible care to gain some advantage over each other. So when you, when you enter into Misera Larga, and remember theirs, not yours, and before you place your foot on the ground, you must gain an advantage by doing one of the following five things. Gain the sword, shut out the sword, remove your body from the sword's presence, which is even more of a shutting out the sword, aiming your sword at the sword hand, or placing them under obligation to parry. Now, some of these you can actually do all at the same time, but he said you, you must be doing one of these five things when you enter into wide measure. If you're not, you're not controlling the fight and you're, you're uh, possibly gonna get hit. So all that to say, if you step into their measure and you aren't doing one of these things, you will soon be chanting that mantra from Arrested Development, I have made a terrible mistake. So do it, do it. All right, I'll pause for questions. Can you repeat that list of five things? Yes, sir. So gaining the sword, the simple game, shutting out the sword, removing your body from the sword's presence while shutting it out, aiming your sword at their hand, or placing them under the obligation to parry, which is kind of a faint, kind of you know something else that you're doing that makes them do the oh crap swipe left. Coolio, all right. Hey, um, I just had a thought. If yes, sir. That thing you were discussing earlier about pointing the sword at your opponent's hilt, which seems like really bad advice in our game. Maybe without a rubber tip, those swept tilts are actually a little more vulnerable to a trust. So maybe it's actually more of a threat with a sharp. Just um, but it also depends on what you mean by aiming. I mean, I, I wouldn't say you're doing the Spanish, you're laying it right on top of them, right? Right. So yeah, if, if we're talking, in fact, that's why the Spanish hilt, the, the cup hilt, I think developed with that curved edge is mm -hmm. you've got those points right there. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I, I think that's a good point, but I also believe, 
as you know, Mike, uh, against and in line with our kind of variable terms in these manuals. Sure. Uh, I'm, I mean, read Saviolo. If you take it literally, it's a stupid fight. It's a really stupid fight. But when you think about what, what against means is really more in line, then it starts making much more sense, right? Right. right. Cool. All right, we are at 209. We're doing pretty well. Good. Okay, posture transitions. Um, this is a concept I've been teaching for a while because it just kind of made sense. It's one where I didn't really know or care if the masters were using it tactically like I did. It's there, it's viable, and by golly, I'm making use of it. Faber's does make use of it in one play, and that's kind of a long time ago where it kind of keyed into me that I should be doing something similar. But it, even there, it's not really laid out as a ready tool. So I was really happy to see that the Vienna Anonymous discusses in a few places the benefit of transitioning from a defensive posture to an offensive one and back again. Um, transitioning from one posture to another can be a tool for a number of tactical things you are doing. Don't be passive about why you shift positions while in measure. Do it deliberately and know what you're trying to achieve by doing it. It really shouldn't be, well, okay, I'm standing here in this posture and nothing's happening. So let me change to something else and see if something happens. Each posture change you do needs to be a provocation and it should be gaining you some kind of advantage, either in safety, distance, tempo, or some combination of those. So what I suggest is actively practice, pra uh, <laughs> actively practice the transition between terza and seconda and terza and corta, for instance, maybe even terza and prima, and maybe even Capoferro's terza and the forward leaning Faber's terza. Basically, just go from a back weighted stance to a front weighted stance and practice doing it smoothly, practice doing it quickly, practice doing it explosively. Um, it is a tool, and you can use that tool in different ways. The Vienna Anonymous describes the terza as the one from Capoferro on page three. That's the back leaning terza. And also describes the low terza as found in Fabris. That transition from those two back weighted terzi to the forward leaning second, seconda, or quarta is a threat or provocation where you're trying to make your opponent do something. It is a feint where you're trying to make your opponent do something. It is itself an attack or it's a preparatory to move or lunge where you're shifting your weight and you're, and you're about to do something. Being able to do all these smoothly and under full control is, is vital in my personal opinion. Uh, the, the Vienna Anonymous author, uh, author even mentions, don't be jerky about these movements, be smooth about them. Those who have trained with me know smooth and deliberate are the rule. Vienna Anonymous discusses the viability of this action a few times. For instance, uh, on page seven, when talking about why you should judge measure by the front foot, the author says, if he bends his body back as shown in figure 38, which is Fabris's plate 11, you will feel you are out of measure. While if he, your opponent, brings it forward without moving his feet, he will have, have advanced by more than a half sword's length. Also on page 14, when the author is discussing how to of invitations and the need to not be too close, do not move your feet, but rather pull your body closer or further, depending on whether you are in measure largo or stretta. So if you find yourself too close, for instance, and you want to do an invitation, you can go back into your back weighted stance and you're pulling your distance back enough that you might be able to then still pull off an invitation. So you're using that shifting in posture to create new dynamics where you can take advantage of their sword, you can, you can make openings, you can maybe gain a, uh, an invitation where you were once too close, you just shift backwards and now you're far enough away that the invitation makes a little more sense. So all that to say, the importance of that transition and doing it smoothly and explosively and even slyly, however you need it, I, I cannot overstate. I think it's important to work on that and we tend to gloss over that in our practices. Pause for questions. All right, Coolio. So these last two sections 
our broader concepts of how we should be using the techniques I've described and the ones that you already know and how you should be drilling and practicing. These kind of get at how to use all the concepts and techniques um, to perfect your fight, to, to, to do a better fight. So the first one is closing under protection. Or another way to say this is incremental movements. This was a really big aha moment for me personally. Um, attacking from wide measure, even when you have the stringer, even when you've gained the blade has always been risky, particularly when you attack into a stillness and you try to use a simple attack, just a straight, I've gained their blade, I'm coming straight in. Uh, even when you have all the advantages of the stringer and, and uh, well, you think the tempo, you're making a one and a half tempi motion, according to Capoferro, which really isn't terribly difficult to parry or counter. And the v Vienna Anonymous author points this out on page seven. So on some level, I knew and practiced that moving in in stages was the preferred way to do it. Or that ideally, you, of course, what Capoferro lays out is you want to make them come to you. You're gonna put them in a position where they think they see the great opening and they're gonna come take it. And so all you're doing then is countering, right? Um, I'd read parts in Fabris that use this idea of inching in to great advantage, but I've never really seen it laid out as clearly as the Vienna Anonymous uh, lays it out. So the Vienna Anonymous describes that it's best to move in in increments until you are close enough that there's no chance the opponent can parry. And I'll lay these this out in, in little bits as well. So one quote is, as long as his feet are stationary, he can break measure and your sword won't reach him. Therefore, do not attack, but rather advance into the measure of strata while maintaining or taking some advantage by adjusting your sword's placement, okay? Um, maintain the advantage all the way to when you strike is another thing that is said. So when you're working on the plates from Capoferro or Giganti, for instance, you close and you stringer at measure larga. And this, we, those of us who work on these, very common, this is what we do. You are trying to force them to take that tempo and close the rest of the way. But if they don't, you do not pause, but you also do not commit to attack at that point. You practice taking those incremental advantages, like I said, zigzag or moving in little by little, as long as their feet are still. You do this either until you are in strata and they move their feet, or until your point is as close to your target as their forte is to your point. So the, the issue here is they can't, they can't parry you if your point is six inches from their body and their forte is six inches from their point because you will start moving before they start parrying and you will hit them before their forte hits your point. So this is his goal. This is what he, he's saying you want to achieve is to close until you can make your opponent move bigly or close until you have reached the point that they cannot under any circumstances parry you. Um, that means either their forte is a good distance away when you finally attack, either because of something you did or because of their mistake, or it means you've worked your way pretty close. Um, the author even writes, if the opponent tries to free his sword with the cavazione, do not attack while in measure larga, even if he moves his feet. So even if you can get them to move their feet while you're in larga, you don't want to attack. You're still, you've got a, a, a full tempi and a half or two tempi to get in there on a very long lunge. It would be dangerous, the author says, because he could break measure and parry. Instead, you can advance and gain the sword on the other side. So you get them to twitch when you're in, in wide measure. And as they twitch, you use that twitch to take another advantage and you slide your foot a little bit forward and you start inching into that strata, that, that narrower measure. Another quote, you must always maintain your engagement or go from one engagement into another until the opponent moves their point while offering an opening or until you get close enough to strike. 
So I'm going to walk you guys through an example of this. Um, this is a, a play I thought through the other day as an example of, of, of what this might look like. Um, and I'll try and take it slow so, so, so people can write it down if they want to. I can also try and publish my notes, although they're kind of computer chicken scratch, but okay. So maybe you stringer on the outside as you step into wide measure. Okay, this is action one. I come into measure, I stringer, I, lock, I, I try and control you on my outside line. They, my opponent, immediately does a cavazione to the inside line, but they hold back. They don't close in on me, so they don't close any distance. So I follow their blade as they cavazione. I switch into a seconda and I slide my foot forward a little bit. So I'm maintaining an advantage while gaining a little more space. So now I'm, I'm blocking them off on the inside line. Um, without pausing, I then might transition to quarta. So now suddenly my blade flies much closer to their face, hopefully freaks them the hell out. Um, but I'm maintaining advantage of the blade. So that's actually the third action. The first was wide measure. The second was tracking their blade and inching forward. The third one is now transitioning into a new posture where I've now closed my blade closer to them. Their visceral reaction to this makes them swipe across the inside and panic. I triggered that action. I knew it was going to happen. So all I'm going to do is drop my point, let their sword sail over mine. And then I've got the clearance because they've now moved their blade completely offline to just go straight in in seconda, locking their blade out and striking them, action four. So that is four actions on my part. Move in the measure, slide and adjust, adjust posture and try and take a little more, few more inches, and then the final attack. Um, interestingly, without meaning to, when I came up with that action, what I've actually described is plate seven, except you're starting on the outside and you incrementally close instead of then coming to you. Everything else is virtually the same. But so instead of the stringer and attack if they do nothing, which is two actions, which is what I used to teach years ago, you now have four incremental actions where you're staying safe the whole time and your opponent is panicking as you get closer and closer. All right, let me pause for a question. That was, that was a lot to throw out there, but I think hopefully you, got, you all can grab that one. So one thing I'm not quite following in the play is the staying in uh, second and then moving to fourth. Um, like in my mind, as soon as they disengage, I would want to, to move into fourth. Um, so I'm closing the line in seconda in wide measure. As they disengage, I'm moving my hand to fourth, but I'm still staying in a back terzo. And so then what I've, what I've said is then move into to quarta posture. Okay. So yeah, I'm not moving my hand at that point, but my body is suddenly, blah, right? So that's what I meant by Corta. Yeah, the posture itself, not the hand position. Apologies. Uh, I have a question. Actually, yes. two. Um, one, let's assume that um, you're not close enough to hit on that fourth action. OK, what would be your action at that point? What I might do then is, OK, they've, they've swept their sword. They've tried to hard mm -hmm. parry you. Um, you are in a forward leaning motion, mm -hmm. you could easily do a pass in a hard secondo. Okay. So you bring that back leg forward and then you're going to close like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And if you keep that, that your sword in seconda, they've already swept theirs way out to your outside. You should have all the space and time in the world to just, to, to just ram it through them. Okay. So um, a, a, a bigger action, but still that fourth action. Yeah. Um, because when you were talking about the actions they maintain. A lot of us, when you're dealing with a, a taller versus shorter opponent, you're going to take. You're often, even when they make that big action, yep. you may not be. You may still be at the edge of strata or the edge of. You're just coming out of wide measure, really. Right. And so you, there's a lot more incremental steps that are involved. Yeah. So some of my students here, Jamie, um, are just over five feet. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've tried to do uh, with, and, and I, think, I think Wendy and I have had this discussion, um, I've had this discussion with Meredith and others, and this is where I started thinking, 
about incremental before I even read the Vienna Anonymous is that mm -hmm. some people to fight me, mm -hmm. they cannot do it in two steps. They just right. cannot. So that's when I started thinking through from their point of view how to do this. And then, like I said, I was thrilled to see the VA say, no, this is really something you do, right? Right. The second question I add, have is, let's assume they don't make that big, wide you know, panic, but they're actually, they come and do uh, a, come to Perry, are you going to Cavazione around them? So they're not all the way off that line. They're I mean, threatened, but not that threatened. Right. If, if they, the point is they're trying to beat your sword. Even mm -hmm. if they don't make a huge sweep, even if they do make a Cavazione that tries to beat your sword, you're dropping your tip. So you're that you are at that point doing the Cavazione. You're dropping your tip and then you're bringing it back online. You are still going to lock their blade out, and you act. May, you may actually physically gain it at that point if if they still have their point online. So I still see. The only nuance there is you would want to drop your point and immediately get your forte up in the mm -hmm. way. Um, that's the only nuance I would say, and you should still be doing that probably even with the with the wide sweep. Okay. So yeah, I still think you could do it. Um, if you wanted to drill this this type of action, then. I mean, you know, Doug is the perfect tall person to yeah. try and play it with. Uh, try and see the differences between just coming, snapping back online versus a, you know, a, a, a oh shit parry. And I bet, I bet your action won't change much. Um, just simply kind of how much, not strength, but how much structure your arm needs to support may, may be slightly different, but probably not even that. The last question I have is a technical one, just from uh, from interpreting what VA says, is it's to maintain the advantage the whole way as you're coming through incrementally as long as their feet are still. So that was, uh, technically, I don't think, I'm not sure that the, the author said that. That was me taking two things the author said and putting them together. Because basically, okay. if you can make them move while you're in strata, mm -hmm. that is a tempo to act. Okay, and, and a lot, a lot of the manuals get that very, very tempo. Okay, the, the thing that the the difference that the Vienna Anonymous gets at is, you don't want to take that tempo when you're in Larga, right? Okay, because it's way too long, and I think that that is actually written in in the margins in Capafero, but it's okay. never said uh, specifically, if that makes sense. Okay, I just want to make sure I have the concept right as opposed to right. Anything else. Okay, so so it. so don't try don't try to attack them from Larga even if they move their feet. But if you can get to Strata and make them make a big you know foot or weight movement, then you, you should be able to have them. But if you can't do that, you continue to to to, to inch away at them. Inch in them. Okay, got it. Cool. Quick I'll, quick question that's uh, not specific to that action, but as I'm listening to these, is everything in Vienna single sword? Uh, just as I'm going through it to interpret yeah. or, okay. I yeah. didn't know if I should be considering daggers or anything with that. No, this, this is all, um, I, I don't think it lays it out specifically, but all the plates and stuff that, that the Vienna Anonymous seems to reference are single sword plates. So I think this was gonna be a fencing master's uh, uh, book on the single sword based on what they learned from these other three manuals is my belief. Now that said, Ernesto, you know as well as I do, eighty percent of that is still absolutely viable, even with dagger in hand. Yeah, it was when you'd mentioned hat being safe once your point was as close to your opponent as the forte. My first thought had been just from our SCA background of what's their other hand doing. Yeah, and how yeah, to yeah, consider yeah. that in. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And so the the caveat with a dagger is that holds true on the outside line. On the inside line, you still have something else you need to make sure that you don't get wrong. That would be my my addition, I guess. There. All right. Um, cool, cool. On to the last section. Uh, this pulls it all together, in in a way. And this this is this is a big tactical mind uh, uh, thought process. So I've I've called it constant movement, or don't let them think. Some of you will probably seem to recognize this concept from Fabris's second book, where he talks about constantly walking towards your opponent without stopping in guard. Um, 
I don't think it's, it's exactly the same thing, but the concepts are, are there. I've suspected for years that something like this is what we should be doing, uh, that we shouldn't be stopping in guard when we're in measure. And sure enough, the, the, the VA author works it into the entire system. This thing, there are 10 or 15 different quotes out of the manual that support this point of view. So this is, this may be what this author was going to try and make kind of their, their, their piece de resistance, you know, the thing that they really brought to the fore. So it makes sense tactically. You stringer the blade, you step into measure with the advantage. If you pause, you're allowing your opponent to come up with a counter plan. You have quickly overloaded their, 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 their mental computer. And if you pause, they have time to clear the, the cache and come up with something else. So your goal should be to continually change the dynamic before they can come up with a solution to that puzzle you've just presented them. So by that measure, when we pause and we do, as I call, we just play swords at, you know, at, at wide measure, we're actually doing it wrong. If you have lost the advantage, you get out and try again. If you have the advantage, you keep moving forward. Um, so a, a quick note, some who will go nameless will say that they're doing this by constant movement, by constantly moving around and shifting and whatever. And, and those of you who know who I'm talking about will know who I'm talking about. Except that they aren't taking any advantages. They're simply giving you their rhythmic tempos while they're remaining safe. And then they usually close an attack in one or two grand motions. So note the difference about what I mean by constant movement. You are gaining an advantage and not giving it up as you flow in toward the attack. So advantage, 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 advantage. It's not just constant movement, you know, at, at wide measure. All right. So put concisely, stale tempos are deadly. You do not want to attack into a stale tempo. And this goes back, Jamie, to what we were just talking about with, with still feet versus moving feet. If someone is standing still, they are in a stale tempo. And even after they've moved, the tempo they gave you grows stale almost immediately. So the, the author says, it is not good to be the first to move while in misera stretta, save by drawing back. So if you're both in misera stretta and you haven't gotten them to move, the implied advice here is to get back and start again. And you're trying to force them to twitch to your actions and, and you continue to make advantages. So like I said, there are, okay, 10 places where I found the Vienna Anonymous author references the idea of moving without pausing. And I could sit and read these to you. I mean, but basically it's, um, let, me, let me get you the, the really interesting ones to me. Um, well, the first one, after gaining the opponent's sword in this manner, which is a simple gain, immediately go forward without pausing between when you find the sword and when you go forward. So there's so that that concept of you don't gain the blade and then sit there. And I'm I am guilty of this too. So I'm, you know, there's no stones being thrown here. Um show him that you are attacking. And what this is, this is referencing kind of a feint. And if he does not attempt to parry your void, you just keep moving forward with your point while gliding along his edge without touching it. Never stop between when you force him to parry and you carry your attack home. If he does attempt to parry or void it, it will give you that tempo and opportunity to strike him in the other opening he creates. Uh, but then here's a very interesting one that, that I, I sat and thought about for a while. Once one foot is on the ground, immediately lift the other so that your body always only rests on a single foot. So when you're coming into measure, once you have gained that blade at wide measure, according to the Vienna Anonymous, you should not have two feet on the ground at any one time. You should always be inching in, whether you're passing steps or whether you're a, a, a crescimento uh, in. So that is something that I, I, I will admit, I got to practice. I really need to work on that. Um, I still pause. I still try and play the, 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 ha ha, I have you now, you know, game from, from a slight distance. Um, once you have gained one of these advantages, they may or may not make a tempo and they may advance or retreat. Regardless, the author says, go forward without pause and without other motions between the time you gain one of the advantages and when you proceed forward. 
never stop since by doing so you would give the opponent a tempo in which to do something, to save themselves or even to strike. So understand, to reiterate or to, to kind of reword it, what you're trying to do is unsettle them as you move in and keep them unsettled the whole time until you strike. And even with simple advantages, I gain the sword on the outside, the kibatsu on the inside, I immediately regain it. Those complexities stack up in people's minds if you continue to do them until by the time you hit them, they're just completely flustered. Now the expert fencers are not as flustered, but the medium and the and beginner fencers absolutely will get flustered in that. And they'll start making bigger motions. They'll start doing crazier things. So you want to not move and pause because then you're giving them time to flush that cash, to, to reset their combat system and try and figure out a way out of the trap that you've set for them. So taking the last section on incremental motions and this section on constant motions and putting them together, you should spend some of your drilling time and some of your sparring time working on these two ideas of incremental advantages and taking them all in quick succession. Um, and all the prior sections on how to gain and what, what, what to do in wide measure all play into this. They're all part of the tool sets that you're using in these tactics. So I will say that these are more tactics than tools. And then the other things above are, are the tool sets. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I'll, I'll throw John Drake under the bus for this. Um, I was sparring with John at Adult Swim a couple years ago. And we were generally going back and forth in our successes. He'd get me a couple of times, I get him a couple of times, blah, blah, blah. So I took a step back and I very actively cleared my head and reminded myself, once you gain that stringer at Larga, move in constantly under protection and don't stop. So I kind of, I, I, I kind of envisioned that very quickly and stepped back in. Those exchanges lasted about a second each and I got several of them in a row on John, which of course, most of you will know is not easy. Afterward, he made the observation that, uh, that fighters are often used to the social agreement or the social arrangement. Even when you lay on his call, you step in, you cross blades, and then you both kind of mentally nod at each other. And it's like, I'm ready to go, right? Um, but that's the point, he's right, and that's the point. While your opponent is taking the time to process what's happening, which might be, okay, now I'm ready, you've already changed the context and come closer and you're about to do it again. So, oh, there's also, there was a HEMA tournament. I did the same thing. I, I lost a couple of, of, of points in the middle of a fight, like arm points, just some cuts. And I got a little bit annoyed at myself. So I stepped back and I thought, go in, go in and just, I got the next two complete kill points. Uh, again, the same thing, one second each, just closed in, didn't stop and hit. So ironically, however, this can be a very quick and boring fight to watch for the audience. Um, I do recognize, I've had this discussion with people before, what some people want out of a fight is a movie-like feeling of swashbuckling. Ha ha, he he, dodge, parry, spin, woo, right? Um, but, Practicing and getting good at what I'm describing here is, for me, the ultimate expression of a thrust-oriented sword fight. And that's what I personally am aiming for, is trying to get, trying to get that high-speed chess match in my favor. And even if the audience doesn't know what just happened, I know what just happened. And that's where I'm trying to get to. All right. So the end. We're just past an hour. That was actually faster than I thought it would be. We've got about 20 minutes if you guys want to have a more open conversation and I can answer some more questions about all of these concepts about what I know. And again, I'm still figuring this out. And the, my next plan is to uh, attack uh, the C13 manual and to see what it says about these same ideas. Uh, Rainier asked me to try and read through it and compare the two, compare the, 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 the nuances. So hopefully I'll have a version of this in a year or two that has, it's the C13. But anyway, that is all. Um, if you guys want, I can turn off or I can go ahead and, and answer questions while we're still recording. And then I'll turn off when anyone wants to uh, say something that's not recorded. Uh, just for questions. Um, uh, quick question. Have, sure. oh. Sorry, 
Um, just quick question since you mentioned C13, what was the other one M something and is it translated? Yeah, it's in the same book. So it's in Rainier's book. He got, okay. uh, he got two of them and he compared them. And basically the, he and uh, Jan Schaefer, um, what they found was that the two books are almost identical uh, in what they say. So what they think is that someone wrote a book these two other fencing ma masters kind of sketched it out and then they took it back to their to their schools and that's what we're looking at here is is kind of that that writing with a little bit of notes in the margins about that other fencing book uh is is currently what i think uh Rainier believes so do they talk at all about how to regain the advantage if you happen to lose it uh effectively if you've lost the advantage, you can't regain it effectively back out. Break measure. Okay. Illidor, you had something. Hello. So we, uh, the thought was, is we we had a uh, comment regarding high speed or speed. I think the, maybe the better word is efficient. Yeah. Okay. So it, yeah, I, I mean, really, you're gliding in. You're right. I, I may, may not have said speed. It takes me a second to go to, to do a lunge. Basically, doing what I'm talking about is slightly more than that because you are kind of rearranging your way in. So yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's more, I don't like speed. I like smooth, personally, as, as you well know. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So yes, always be closing. Um, always be closing or get the heck out if you've lost the advantage. I'll, I'll add that to it. Um, wait on the feet. So what I would say is, you know, as you're closing, um, I'm back on the back foot. Now I'm going to close my weights on my on my front foot as I close, weights on the back foot. Maybe if I'm doing a pass, it's, it's an actual walking pass. Um, so all that to say, there shouldn't be a time when I'm pressing with both feet into the ground. One of them should always be effectively moving a little bit. So uh, two quick questions. One is that you had you had mentioned that this was similar, but not what Fabris was saying in his second book. I've never read that, but I've heard people describe it to me. How is is there any way you could say in which they are definitely sort of different approaches? So let me caveat that with saying I haven't done a deep study of the second book myself, but the translations I've seen or the interpretations I've seen from a few people is you stand up straight, you bend a little bit and you just walk at someone. And there, the technically what it says is you're not stopping in posture, you're not stopping in any stance. So the whole idea, it, it's the same concept. You are overloading your opponent's uh, uh, mental game by simply continuing to come at them and they only have time to redirect a couple of times. And so all you have to do is control that first entry and then and then you're in, okay? So as Tom points out in his book, a lot of people think that that is a very advanced game and so they're not playing it. I think what the Vienna Anonymous is getting at is no, that's what we should be doing. Some version of that is what we should all be doing. Uh, how would the idea of constant motion with advantage compared to the stress or rata? I don't know. I, um, I would have to sit down and compare notes with Mary, um, with Puck. I think it's kind of similar from what I know of, of the, the Highline Destreza, what, which is what I'll call it, not the, uh, the, not the cut and thrust Destreza. I think it's kind of similar in that the whole point there is you are fighting for advantage in a very upright position. And as soon as you have enough of the advantage is when you close and hit. Um, if there's a difference to me, the difference is that you're going to fight for advantage on the edge of measure until you have it enough that you go straight in. Whereas the Italians like get it as soon as you enter and don't let go of it as you go in. If I'm doing a comparison, but I don't know that for a fact, I would have to really talk with people who have studied the Destreza and see if there's a difference. And it wouldn't shock me if there is no difference. Um, as I've said before, and as I'm going to try and at some point give a lecture on uh, inductive versus in deductive view of fencing, all 
of the systems are the same when you look at them in a certain light. We all use the same fundamentals. We all use the same tactics. I can look at what the Spanish and the German are doing and I can translate that into the Italian. Um, they aren't a huge difference except when you are starting to learn them. So they all end in the same place. They're, they all are covering the same ideas but you have to take a certain path before you can start really grasping all of those ideas. The so reason, what, go the ahead. reason I bring it up is having fought you do it during doing attempting to do VA, having fought people doing RADA, it feels uh, on the receiving end very similar. It could be. Um, uh, and it looks, except in the pathway, a little bit more circular with RADA, but the the motions and the tactics um, are very similar. Uh, Ernesto can can yeah. talk more about it. Think about think about it this way: the way I tend to view Spanish versus German versus Fabres versus Capafero is it really breaks down to well, I want to stand this way. Well, I want to stand this way. Well, I want to stand this way, but we're all going to do the same things from, from our respective stance. So the Spanish having a more upright, they are doing stringering, they are doing uh, cavazione, they are doing beats, they're doing the same things as the capoferro fencer who wants to bring his body away from the blade. Um, and then the fabris fencer who wants to only make this the target and to close straight into the blade, we're all doing the same actions. We're all trying to direct the sword and overload our opponent's uh, mental game. Um, and we're all using generally the exact same tactics to get there. The difference is how are we using our bodies? How are we standing with our bodies? And that's it really. You know, to, to pull Fabris off, you got your feet usually narrower, you're leaning it forward a bit, maybe a lot depending. To pull Capafero and Gigante off, you're pulling your body back from the point, but once you start closing, you still lean forward. Um, to pull the Spanish off, you're more upright, you're walking like, uh, as Bob used to say, a haughty Italian noble. Um, and then the German are the Cuisinarts in some way. Uh, but even they, you look at their stuff and it still translates. It's still the, the backward stance, the forward stance, the whole thing. All the blade work, even if it has different terminology, is really tr achieving the same things. My second question here is, if you're applying this, uh, again, motion forward with advantage and your opponent is, it's kind of, who is it when your, your opponent is someone who also wants to move forward? Is it a question of who gets there first, you know, off the block, uh, especially in someone who really likes to, to aggress right. heavily. Let's say they're even not playing VA, but you know, you're dealing with someone who is wants to, it wants to give you that forward motion. Right. You're not going to just kind of come in there. So this is where I would use Capoferro straight out of the book. Mm -hmm. um, offer an invitation, give them the chance to come in, and then they're coming into your stillness. They're coming into your stale tempo. So I am taking that advantage. I am opening the invitation. And as soon as they start, start closing that distance to their sword, I'm regaining it and hitting them. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is the classic Capoferro, but it assumes that your opponent is bringing the distance to you. And so what the Vienna Anonymous gets into is when I have to go to them, here's how I'm going to do it. Okay. And I'm, I mean, even when I, was, when I was with you guys in Minneapolis, I had broken down into many SCA fighters will come to me, but many others will stay at range and will not do anything. So how do we approach that? And I, I was still trying to work through that. Well, this kind of answers a lot of those questions. Got it. All righty. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording. And if y'all just wanna, wanna shoot the you know what, we can do so. How do I stop recording? Oh, there it is. All right, and thank you all for coming. It's been a great class. I'll post this on my uh, Tattershall DC YouTube channel uh, very quickly. Goodbye all.